Hey everyone, Brian Barris here. Um, big thanks to everybody that uh, invited me to give a talk here today um, about the project that we initiated in 2018, uh, manipulating agronomic factors in canola hybrid sowing density and, and harvest management. So just looking at that systems and interplay within those factors within a system, um, a big shout out to the collaborators here who've been a big help, also from Lethbridge, Charles Geddes, uh, Brianne Tidman up in the Comb, Bill May in Indian Head, Ramona Moore at Brandon, all of them and myself with Agriculture Canada. And then Chris Willenborg, who's on a whole bunch of our agronomy trials and giving us some um, good, um, uh, serving as an advisory role in this uh, project as well. Okay, so. Um, why were we interested in doing that? And why is this a priority with the canola industry? Um, well, if you think of some of the evolutions that have been going on and innovations that have been going on in canola, um, it does sort of um, demand that we take another look at that whole systems um, of those factors that I just talked about. Um, you've got 40% or more of canola acres now being straight cut. You've got the introduction of um, a pretty important innovation in uh, pod shadow reduction hybrids. You have, um, with those two innovations, probably some questions or some knowledge gaps in terms of how they interplay with things like sowing density um, and how can you be sure that you're properly staging? Um, do you, does that methodology perhaps need to be upgraded or? Or reviewed as well. And so that was kind of the things we were thinking about when we put this application into the canola cluster. Um, and really, yeah, it's about refinement of, of best grower practices. We talked about the interplay of those factors. Um, and, and, and just, and the fact that they do, and because of the plasticity nature of canola, the way its architecture can vary so dramatically, it really does perhaps change or influence how we should be staging or the methodology we use to stage. And lastly, of course, from a farmer perspective is, yeah, this information is all great. These recommendations are great, but am I gonna make money doing it if I actually adopt it? And so an economic analysis would be forthcoming as well. Um, and really, you know, why we do the agronomy do at the larger scale that we do, um, we're trying to simulate real farm um, experiences and assume the risk first so that we can fully understand how the grower is going to either realize opportunity with the adoption of these new practices or, you know, the recommendation of those practices to avoid. Um, because, you know, you get into these complex studies with multiple factors, uh, you get a range of responses. And so it's not necessarily uh, cut and dry with respect to how we go about making those recommendations. This would be a good example of uh, this table on the right hand side that I'm going to refer to in a minute. But as far as the experimental design goes, there's three factors or main effects that we're going to be investigating in this study. Um, the first one being, um, of course, the pod shadow reduction hybrids. And we were trying to find an early and a late. Um, and so, you know, we settled on L233 or L234. Um, three, four became more important because we now have club roots sort of, um, I guess, expanding or, or becoming more of a threat almost every year, it seems. And then, of course, a later one, L255. And those two hybrids were integrated with the harvest methods of straight cutting or swathing, both at the proper timing, and that with respect to swathing would be 60% color change in the seed pod, or with straight cutting at 10% uh, moisture. Later in, in straight cutting scenario would be 5%. Um, and then we also compared that to a delay in swathing of uh, when color change was um, up to 90%. Um, and then of course, the famous seed rating debate of how you should um, be thinking about with respect to density. Um, we know the biological optimum is probably up here. So our results, it'll be interesting to see if we compare. So 180 seeds per square meter, that's 18 seeds per square foot. Um, but we know most growers, the economic, the farm reality is that they've settled in on something more like or closer to 60 seeds per square foot because they think that gives them maybe six plants per square foot or close to it, I'm not sure. 
Um, and then we chose in uh, middle ground here of 120 as well. And just one thing to think about while I was thinking about that is some of our techs when we were building this table put in, well, if you have 60 seeds going down into the ground uh, at a density um, per square meter, you're probably going to end up with 40. Or if you're at 120 seeds, you're probably going to end up at 70. If you're going 180, it'll probably be 100. Well, the reality is I just did a quick check uh, this past year on our irrigated site, which is pretty good site this year, um, pretty good growing conditions. Um, but 60, the reality was our, we're coming out at a rate of about 50%. So 26 to 32 plants per square foot or square meter. Um, so that's more like three, you know, on average of three plants per square foot um, or, or, you know, four to six plants per square foot if you're up to 120. So the amount of seed you're putting in and your expectations of what plants are going to come up um, may require a bit of a rethink and can change a lot from year to year, as you're well aware. Um, okay, so some quick results we're going to talk about uh, yield and yield stability, those yield trends as they're influenced by sowing density and high productivity or yield potential, and uh, just a couple quick comments on crop phenology and yield component effects. Uh, and you might guess the green bars or box here is a good thing or a thing to draw your attention to on this table. Um, well, how are we doing with seeding rate responses with respect to um, yield that we attain from that? The highest one here, um, close to significantly higher would be 120 seeds per square meter uh, or 12 seeds per square foot. And that's giving us um, the highest yield if you average over these other two um, effects of hybrid and swathing or uh, harvest management. Now, hybrids differed a little bit. That late one, not a big surprise, giving us a little bit more yield. The harvest method is kind of an interesting one on what it's doing for yield. We are getting significantly more yield averaged across seeding rate and hybrid if we're going with straight cutting at the proper moisture content of 10%. Uh, we do suffer a slight reduction if we're swathing, it appears. Um, but again, this is like a big snapshot. So perhaps what's more important, if we take a look at the full interplay of that system, and that's what this busy uh, figure here is, it's not all that complicated. On the y-axis here, you have um, your yields again. And on the x-axis, this proxy for yield stability, in our case, is going to be a coefficient of variation. So where do you want to be on here to have your best system? Well, you want to be all the way to the left which gives you superior yield stability because here's your average bar for yield stability. And then of course you want to be as high as possible because that's yield. So this is your average for yield. And so these green boxes that I've highlighted here um, are, are some interesting ones. So if you look at 255 planted at 120 seeds per square meter, that's giving us our best yields. And here's two cases here. However, it appears, after nine site years anyway, um, which is getting to be a fairly decent data set, is that you actually have better yield stability by swathing as opposed to straight cutting at the right time. Um, and what's interesting here is it seems that that may not be the case for the earlier hybrid, because the earlier hybrid, its superior system was again at that 120 seeds per uh, square meter. Uh, however, best yielding and best yield stability was from a straight cutting operation. Now, what are some um, losers in this thing? We have about a third of real decent um, of 24 scenarios. We've got about a third or about eight that are good, um, but we also have quite a few that are dogs. Um, and so this is where they are in the bottom right-hand quadrant here. What they all have in common, if you haven't figured it out already, it's not hybrid because they're both in here. It's not swathing versus straight cutting. They're all in here as well, although very few timely straight cuts are in here. But what you do see is 60, 60, 60, 60. It's all that lowest seeding rate. A low seeding rate is giving us poor yield stability. So you might cheat. Here's one here, 60 above average yield but you're going to suffer from yield stability. And as soon as you get differentials in weather or something like that can, that can really influence stability, soil conditions, planting conditions, what have you, um, 
that's when a system you'll really see the weakness in it. Um, so something to keep in mind if you are on that low side for seeding rate. Um, so what do we have here in terms of um, yield component results? Back to the 60 thing I thought I would just discuss because this is so preliminary. Um, you can see that if you look at all these things, like number of branches per plant, uh, looking at the main racine versus secondary uh, branches and things like fertile pods, the weight of those, the number of seeds, blah, blah, blah. Um, you do see the plasticity in canola because it's, its compensatory effect here is very, very high. Um, it's trying, it's trying real hard to compensate for the fact that it's been cheated back on a, on a uh, low spatial density. But the fact is from our previous slides, we know that it wasn't quite enough um, to change or to overcome um, what the other systems are offering. Now, if we talk about how the interplay of sowing density uh, might change with respect to both hybrid and now let's say if we look at a really high productivity zone like Lethbridge irrigation in 2021, um, it changes. So there's differences. So take for example, overall averaged over everything, we do have a linear positive increase in yield responses to seeding rates all the way through to 180. And we have the same thing and even steeper uh, with the late hybrid. So we're definitely getting an influence in this trend from this one here. But if we look at the early hybrid, it's more like we saw in the first slide on our results where we're peaking out at 120 and then that's it. So a couple of things to consider here is, you know, productivity zone and the changes you want to make with respect to seeding rate and probably hybrid, depending on what you think your yield potential is. Um, so what's good for irrigation is not going to be good down the road for dryland, for example. Um, so keep that in mind. It's something to consider as well. So take home messages to your farm gate. Um, in one sentence, it's that system of incorporating 120 seeds per square meter or 12 seeds per square foot um, with timely straight cutting equaled high and stable yields, particularly if you're using an earlier hybrid. But there is no shame in hanging on to that swather because we did observe higher yield stability in those later maturing hybrids. Pod shatter reduction hybrids are living up to, if there was hype, they've certainly lived up to it because it eliminated all seed loss so far in our study. And the point here is this whole, if you haven't heard about this, genetics by environment, by management, or that G by E by M, that is a fancy global term for our systems agronomy. And that really is true. And you're going to see it at the farm as you manipulate those factors, don't ever think of them in isolation or with silo mentality because they will react, hybrids react differently when you change management practices. With that, um, thanks for the opportunity and uh, just a big thanks to my team here, particularly Maya Sabetti here, who did all the data analysis and a big thanks to the Canola Council for uh, funding this project, leveraging it to the Canadian Ag Partnership to get more funds from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So thanks a lot and uh, have a great day.